honor to be here and uh, uh, come here to see the snow again. It was melting. <laughs> <in> the... <laughs> but uh, one thing I want to, uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, the, uh, our new book, Tribes, uh, International Hockey History. Ray Rolak he is here. He wrote the forward and uh, he came up from Detroit. Uh, so he's going to be on the Before I run an eight-minute, uh, just an eight-minute segment that I'd worked on with uh, ESPN uh, about eight years ago or, or something like that, um, I want to mention that what we want to say is about the, 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 there's two schools of thought when it comes to hockey, that, that it was uh, almost plopped down out of the air in, in, in 1875 and given to a, a bunch of privileged white students in McGill University. And, and that, but we come from a belief that it, that it was an evolutionary game, roots dating back to earliest man, and, and that to put it in that context, just before we go into the Colored Hockey League, uh, and we'll, we'll address it right after the video a little bit, uh, that because it's an we believe it's an evolutionary game, the, the, the contributions that blacks have made to this game, particularly the Colored Hockey League of the Maritimes in the, in the, in the late 1800s, to have that context that, yes, this is a game that is continuing to evolve to this day. And, and that, that I, I think what gets lost <coughs> when, it, when it was taken in the context of that it was 1895 or 1875 that it was that it was, it was plopped out of the air. That's easy to miss contributions made by others, and others of, of different color, color or race or or, or uh, this is this. It not only includes blacks, but it includes French Canadian contributions, Irish contributions. Uh, so just keep that in context as as we go forward, uh, uh, and, and why we feel this history is important, not just as a novelty, but as something that, uh, that, that, that as, as a way of setting, a, setting the historical records straight, that, that this, uh, to, to acknowledge uh, the, these contributions from the Colored Hockey League, uh, acknowledges not only, it, it broadens the picture of what other, other groups have brought to this game. So, uh, I'll kick off the video right now. During February, we celebrate Black History Month, in particular the pioneers from Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass to sports figures Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali. Many names are familiar, as are their achievements, but more than a celebration, Black History Month is also about education, a chance to learn about other historic figures whose stories are largely unknown. Jeremy Shapnow on some black athletes frozen out of the history books. These are not the faces of hockey. Of the four major team sports, hockey is by far the whitest. The conventional wisdom holds that the game was pioneered and codified by ruddy-faced men of French and Scotch-Irish extraction. Men who look nothing like these men. But it turns out that the game has never been lily white. Not even a hundred years ago. Not anyway, according to historians George and Daryl Fausty. They argue that hockey's roots are black and American. A lot of this history was either conveniently ignored, lost, or simply forgotten. The brothers Fosti are the authors of Black Ice, the lost history of the colored hockey league of the Maritimes. Their thesis is simple, yet astounding. Hockey as we now know it, the slap shot, Athletic goaltending and skating was introduced not by the white men who generally get the credit, but years earlier in Nova Scotia by the sons and grandsons of American slaves. 
one of the biggest obstacles we have in revealing this research is the fact that people say, no, it can't be true. We've already credited certain individuals with some of these innovations. You must be wrong. The story begins not in Canada, but here in Jericho, New York, on Long Island. Today, the main made in is a restaurant. In the mid-19th century, it was the home of Abigail Hicks, who would hide runaway slaves in her attic. In fact, the Underground Railroad on Long Island, which ferried slaves to freedom in Canada, was operated out of this nearby church. Runaways came up, and a lot of them, they hid out so they can continue up to Canada, and a lot of them stayed in the community. Drakeford Levi's ancestor, Eliakim Levi, was among those who stayed on Long Island, helping hundreds of other runaways find their way to Canada, mostly to Halifax, the capital of Nova Scotia, the rugged, windswept province 700 miles north and east of Long Island. Eventually, these former slaves would help create the Colored Hockey League. If you look at the history of the CHL, you see that the real legacy of the CHL is that these, this is the Underground Railroad legacy, and that is the legacy that gave us modern hockey. The Fosties say that the Colored Hockey League was organized more than 30 years after the last runaway slaves reached Nova Scotia in about 1895. Initially a church league, the players adhered to a declaration of faith that emphasized sportsmanship and athleticism over brute force. When I found out this league had used the Bible as their rule book for playing hockey, I says, wow, this is profound. Wayne Adams was born and raised in Halifax. His father, grandfather, and great uncle played in the Colored Hockey League. The church did everything in terms of the social status and social development of black people in this province and throughout North America. They saw this as an opportunity to, to move up socially and climb a social ladder and gain equal footing with the larger white community with the ultimate goal being that one day blacks will be equal and sport will be the catalyst to make that occur. In the absence of brawling, the hockey played in the CHL was a lively, offensively creative game. Fifty years before Boom Boom Jeffreyon introduced the slap shot to the NHL, the Fosties say it was a staple of the game in the CHL. You see references describing what they called then baseball hockey, which was a slap shot. They didn't have the name for it back then. But one thing or another, they were, they were slapping that, that puck down the ice 50 years ahead of everybody else. The Fosties claimed that the first goaltender to play not just in an upright position was Henry Franklin of the Dartmouth Jubilees, who stood three foot six. Henry Brace's Franklin was aggressive in goal. The, the argument's been the, the reason he was the first player to go down on ice was, as some people have sarcastically said, he was already there. In its heyday, just after the turn of the 20th century, the CHL was flourishing from Nova Scotia to nearby New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. Games might attract as many as 1,200 fans. Despite drawing from a relatively small portion of the population, black teams sometimes defeated the best of the white teams. Here, for instance, is a story about the Chibuctos, a powerful white team falling to the all-black Eurekas 9-7 in 1899. Often when the black teams had a good showing against them, you never had another repeat game. It was almost like, oh my God, we've, we've had the hell scared out of us, we're not going to go back again. Shortly after World War I, the league collapsed, and within a generation, it had all but disappeared from the collective memory of even most black Nova Scotians. The story of the CHL seemed to have been lost. The Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto, how do they recognize these innovations? They don't. But when it's built, the Black Hockey and Sports Hall of Fame in Nova Scotia will. Craig Smith is its president. You go get a hockey book and look at a hockey book in the history of Canada. You don't see anybody in there that looks like me skating on the ice. You don't see any stories about any Black Hockey League in Nova Scotia or any contributions by Blacks to the league other than Willie O'Ree breaking the color barrier in 58. 49 years ago, Willie O'Ree became the first Black man to play in the National Hockey League. Smith wants to see those who came before O'Ree given their due. 
the greatest recognition that I think that can be made is for them to say that yes, this league was here, this league stood, withstood the test of time, and this league gave a lot to what we now have in the NHL. What does the game of hockey owe these pioneers? They, they owe them recognition. Uh, they owe them the respect that's been void for a hundred years. Unfortunately, the proper due and the proper respect that's been due a lot of black athletes in this country has been slow in coming. And so now to go back and say, no, it was black people that revolutionized that sport, that's not going to happen easily. Not without a fight, that's for sure. Jeremy Schapp reporting. Over the NHL All-Star break in Dallas, George and Daryl Fosty presented their findings on the Colored Hockey League to the NHL Diversity Task Force. The NHL listened and is currently in discussion with the Fosties in regards to their research. However, there is still no official recognition of the Colored Hockey League. I'll be uh, putting up some slides in the back as my brother will be speaking. Uh, um, I'll just do the first two here. These are just a, uh, this is an image out of the, uh, uh, of the Middle Kingdom period of Egypt, of uh, uh, early uh, 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 stick and ball like uh, uh, games. This is ultimately evolve into having a, uh, going from a ring to a, to a ball. Uh, it's uh, associated, the, the sport uh, originally has been associated with a, uh, either like warrior cult or and and uh, and with uh, the idea of manhood and 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 uh, and uh, death. Uh, so, um, as you see, this like it's, uh, hit hit the ball to the field of Apis. Uh, uh, the, the Apis is a bull god de deity. That's the same bull god deity that you find in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and you have a reference to a game called being called Pico Miku, uh, and uh, that would date. Uh, a thousand years before this image was uh, uh, put on the tomb. <coughs> this is uh, the relief that's in the uh, Athens Museum. Uh, what's interesting about this is that you had uh, uh, skates date back to about 3600 BC and and you had ice skating during the what they call uh, throughout the, the the cultures of the Danube River, River Europe's first great highway uh, during the uh, Bell Beaker period, which is about 1600 to to uh, 2000 BC. Uh, what makes this interesting is that you had cultures that were playing field sport and skating. Now it is obviously no direct proof that well how far back hockey dates, but uh, it is certainly not uh, uh, outside of the realm of possibility that, that these field sports were taken back onto the, onto the ice as possibly as early as 600 BC. But uh, um, I'll uh, turn this over to my brother.